social media companies and the information they allow people to share. That's our first topic today on CNN 10. I'm Carl Azus. Earlier this week, Facebook said any content, posts, or articles that deny the Holocaust would no longer be allowed on its platform. Under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, Nazi Germany murdered 6 million Jewish people and millions of others during World War II. The Holocaust is an infamous example of genocide, the intentional destruction of a religious or ethnic group. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, who is Jewish, said in 2018 that though he finds it deeply offensive for people to deny the Holocaust, he didn't think Facebook should remove content that does that. He said there are things that different people get wrong. But on Monday, Facebook told the Bloomberg Financial and Media Company that it would ban Holocaust denial on its platform. It said it was reversing its policy because there's been a worldwide increase in anti-Semitism, discrimination against Jews, and because there's a quote, alarming level of ignorance about the Holocaust, especially among young people. The company's new rule does not apply to other genocides though, like the Rwandan genocide or the Armenian genocide, which the nation of Turkey denies. And Bloomberg says Facebook did not explain why it would still allow the other content. Zuckerberg admits he's struggled with the tension between standing for free speech and the harm caused by minimizing or denying the Holocaust, but he thinks his company has found the right balance. But that's a challenge that's not only faced by Facebook. People often get their news from social media. There are more than 2 billion Facebook users every month. There are 2 billion who use YouTube, more than a billion who use Instagram, 330 million who use Twitter. And all of these sites have been criticized over the information they choose to allow. In the political world, American Democrats have said Twitter and Facebook haven't done enough to stop misinformation or fake news that spreads online. American Republicans have said the companies unfairly censor conservative speech online. This is according to the Forbes Business Media Company. So social media organizations are often criticized for an uneven approach whenever they work to filter what's posted by hundreds of millions of users. 10 Second Trivia. To win an election, a US presidential candidate needs at least how many electoral votes? 538, 435, 270, or 101? There are 538 electors in total, so a majority of 270 is needed to win the election. And it's projecting that winner that's a key part of our election night coverage. But there may be some additional challenges to doing that this year, and a big one is mail-in voting. There's been some controversy over this, as we reported on our August 20th show. There's also been more interest in it this time around, because many Americans are concerned about catching coronavirus in public polling places. However people feel about mail-in ballots though, several states don't require them to be received and counted by election day. So if the election is close, and if millions of ballots are still in the mail when the polls close on November 3rd, we may not know the outcome for days, possibly weeks. Still, news networks across America are gearing up for the event that's 20 days away. Here's a look at how CNN plans to propose projections. On election night, we'll be doing all the major math behind CNN's major projections. We're gonna share the numbers with you right now and some major projections. I'm Jennifer Jesta, I'm CNN's Director of Polling and Election Analytics. Behind me, you see CNN's Decision Desk. We've got about 14 people who'll be working with us on election night. In the weeks running up to election day, we rehearse election night so many times. We're divided up into teams. Each of the teams typically has one statistician, someone who really understands the math behind the projections that we're making. Each team also has a political expert, a person who knows the geography of each state. So we use several different types of data in making our projections on election night. Our first bit of information about how people are behaving is going to be the exit polls. We'll be looking at what voters who voted sort of early in the morning and through the afternoon are saying to pollsters about why they supported the candidates that they did. When we're ready to make a projection in a state, we're typically looking at several different pieces. It's not just an exit poll. An exit poll is one component of that. What we really need to see in a lot of the battleground states, places like Florida, New Hampshire, we're going to be looking for a lot more than the exit poll. Our first line of defense is a group of sample precincts that match precincts where the exit polls were conducted. And we'll know pretty early in the night how voters in those precincts voted and how that compares to the results of the exit poll. 
CNN projects that Barack Obama will be re-elected. When we're approaching 270 electoral votes, that level that would actually mean we're saying that a person will win the White House, that's when things get very intense on the decision desk and we're looking very closely at the states that are outstanding. Our best line of defense when we're making these projections is that we're getting data from multiple sources. Vote count numbers that come to us from the Associated Press, we look at vote count numbers that are posted on Secretary of State websites and county websites, and we try to confirm that what we're seeing is correct across multiple reporting sources and look for that internal consistency in the data that we're seeing. The Decision Desk has one of the hardest jobs in journalism. We really want to make sure that anything that we project is going to hold up in the end. We're lucky in that we haven't had a, an incorrect projection come out of CNN since 2000, and we hope to never have it happen again. In Washington State, agriculture officials are working to track down murder hornets and bring them to justice. And by that, we mean kill them. These insects, also known as Asian giant hornets, are invasive in the U.S. They first appeared in Washington last year, and no one was sure how they got there. They got their name from the fact that they can kill a human with multiple stings. But they're an even greater threat to bees, as murder hornets can take out a beehive in a few hours. So they're not wanted in America. Several have been spotted near Washington's border with Canada. Entomologists think the insects might have a nest there. So they've been trying to attach tracking devices to the hornets in the hopes they'll lead officials to the nest. One device was glued, but it fell off and the glue got caught in the hornet's wings so it couldn't fly. One device was tied with dental floss, but scientists lost track of it shortly after the bug flew away. So the hunt continues. เราก็ต้องอยู่ในกรงถ้าเราไม่มีกรงเราก็อยู่ลําบากเพราะว่าลิงจะเข้ามาตลอดเวลาแล้วก็จํานวนประชากรลิงเนี่ยมันขยายต